So the next talk is by, uh, held by Tim Messerschmidt, and it's about authentication on Android. Hey. So who of you guys is a Droid, an Android developer? All right, that's good. Web developers? One, one and a half, three, two, something like that. <laughs> All right, great. So this talk is going to be quite interesting for not just native Android developers, but also web developers, cross-platform developers, iOS developers, but I'll go into some specifics for Android. Um, my name is Tim Messerschmidt. I'm a developer evangelist at PayPal, and I had this really bad pun with Star Wars on my slides. I hope you, know, you forgive me, because these are going to be the droids you're looking for. So we are going to have a look at the users and how to actually authenticate them, which techniques are good and which you should rather try to avoid. So I already mentioned I'm a developer evangelist, and quick uh, intro why I actually stand on this stage. First of all, I think uh, that the Google developer user groups are amazing. And uh, I used to be part of the GTUX back then. So um, I think it's worth to actually support them. And so that's why PayPal is actually sponsoring over here. And there is going to be one of the prizes yes, uh, tomorrow at the Hackathon is being paid by us. So please win. And um, so we are having a big approach to actually pushing mobile first. I think lots of people heard about this being mobile first. Lots of companies say they do it. Um, I think it makes sense to nowadays have in mind that people don't just use a laptop, a desktop, PC, and they try to consume your content. Actually, they sit in front of a tablet, they sit in front of a phone, a smartwatch, and they use your stuff. So it makes sense to actually design your things for mobile. We've rebuilt our developer experience. So everything you find at developerpaypal.com is actually really nice. REST APIs um, for payments. <laughs> Sorry for that advertisement. And um, obviously, lots of other things. But today, I'm not going to talk about payments. Today, I'm going to talk about identity. And for me, in the internet, anyone can be anybody, right? Like, you're anonymous. That's how the internet is being designed. So you can go and pretend you're this ninja dude. I think Lego ninjas are always the best way to explain anything. So actually, I should have had an empty slide saying there is a ninja on it. And uh, so for me, I go to a website and you don't really know me. I go to your app and you don't know me. I just downloaded your, uh, your application from the Google Play Store and I'm anonymous, right? So how can you actually make sure that I have a nice experience if you don't know me? Well, for this one question, we should actually set up another question, and that's, do we actually always use the same identity? So identity means, do you guys use your Facebook login or the Google Plus uh, login or things like LinkedIn, GitHub, all these social identities? Who keeps on reusing the same thing over and over? Like, anyone? Like, do you log in with Facebook because it's the first thing on there? Or do you even use different techniques? So who varies them? Who logs in with Facebook, Google+, GitHub, depending on the service? Not with Facebook. Not, not with Facebook, all right. <laughs> so who prefers Google+, sign-in then? Two people, all right. It's a very uh, free. All right, so that's good because I don't think you sh actually should always use the same thing. Actually, there is a big issue with that because you don't want to give away the same identity over and over. And actually, for different services, it makes sense to choose different identities because sometimes you share things which are completely irrelevant for the service that you actually want to log into. And sometimes they actually gather lots of data that they shouldn't have access to. So. For users, it sucks to log in and you, they share stuff that they don't want to share. And for developers, it doesn't make sense for you guys to store stuff that you don't really use in your application. So one thing that I have to talk about is authentication versus authorization. Who knows the difference between those things? All right, that's, that's a few, that's nice. All right. so. Do you guys think authorization should be about profiles, about identity? I don't really think so. 
Authorization is actually about providing access to resources. So that might be you have a RESTful API and you can share something through that. You have Twitter direct messages, you have images somewhere. Those are resources and you want to provide access to that. But you still want to be anonymous. You don't even want to say, hey, I'm Tim, I'm this guy, this is my password. Do you really need my password for that? No, right? There is techniques like OAuth, OAuth2, that actually solve this. Authentication is actually something different. Authentication is mostly about actually providing details about me. So this is about identifying this guy just logging in into your service is actually Tim Messerschmidt. So those things should be totally different. One is about being anonymous. One is being about actually that guy that you want to be and really proving that it's you. And lots of services tend to mess that up because there used to be OAuth 2 and people thought, wow, that's so easy to implement on our server side. Let's just put everything in there. So 95% of all of two providers, social sign-in providers, actually share identity through an actually authorization technique instead of an authentication technique. We'll go into that into, uh, in a second. So current standards, there are tons of current standards about actually providing identity, providing authentication, security. And I want to start off with the most simple, most basic technique, basic authentication. So who of you guys actually uses basic auth in this app? All right, a few of those. So the idea is quite simple. You have a username and a password field somewhere. If it's a web service, you put it into a header or you put it at the end of a URL or at the front of a URL. You uh, can encode it with uh, Base64, but you don't really have to. You should maybe, but that's another thing. So there's lots of different techniques to actually use basic authentication. And every time I see that somewhere implemented, I feel kind of reminded of this. Anyone abstruse goose from the reader? Abstruse goose, anyone? So this is the Death Star's terminal, and R2D2 logs into that. Uh, did you ever wonder how that works at Star Wars? Then R2D2 goes to a terminal, uh, plugs his thing somewhere in, and suddenly all doors open? That's how it works. So he gets access to the tra uh, tractor beam, and that's how he actually does things. And I think that's super uncool, right? So basic authentication, people have to create passwords. They have to do something with that. That's all nice, right? But passwords are not necessarily secure. Another nice comic, I love comics in my slides. Um, this one is from XKCD. It's about password security. So you all know these things like you should have alphanumeric passwords with symbols and you shouldn't repeat things and also you should make sure it's at least eight characters and then it should be something really random and nobody gives a fuck and you can't really store it and you can't remember it. So there are applications like one password which try to help you because they actually generate these random things and it remembers it for you and it's kind of protected by a master password. But once you actually try to remember your own password and you always want to have a specific application password it's, get, uh, it's basically getting really, uh, really confusing. And basically the whole idea of this comic is saying that correct horse battery staple is actually a much better password and more secure than Troubadour and free. So it's actually really secure. It takes more time to actually crack this password and you can even remember it, which is quite nice, than coming up with those random things unless you have somebody else remember it for you. So there is one pass, one password, last pass, tons of those softwares. If you use them, that's nice. Please do so. But also go for correct horse battery staple, maybe another one, but there's actually an XKCD password generator, which has four random things. And it kind of reminds me of those metal albums uh, that used to be there, like that killed Armageddon, darkness, triumphant, something. It's always three really evil words. So come up with those kind of passwords. They are kind of secure and you can actually remember them. Another thing, who knows, who basically knows SCAR security? Ever heard of them? SCAR security? So it's a group of hackers. They call themselves sometimes consultants, but it's more like a, they do it more for the uh, sake of fun and not just about earning money with it. 
And what they do is basically they have a list of different passwords that were leaked at LinkedIn and different companies. They analyze which passwords were in there. And they do things like generating a top thousand list of actually secure and unsecure passwords. So you can actually see how secure passwords are. And I had a look at that list and I thought like, wow, that's actually a nightmare. So <laughs> this is actually quite scary. For that seven person of all users, start with the password password. Who the fuck does that? <laughs> like, that's not secure. Please. Yeah. So who has this? <laughs> Please tell me your username afterwards. <laughs> so, all right, I think we all agree password is not a secure password. Neither is 123456 or 123456678. You make it to the top 10% per of basically the first few passwords in this list. And if we have a look at that list and we go a bit down into that, we see something really scary. 40% of all passwords that are being found in this list basically make it into the top 100. If we go a bit uh, down this road, 91% are in the top 1,000. So if I have a really capable machine and I have one of those really amazing NVIDIA GPUs that can basically uh, calculate with, I think right now it's like three to four teraflops, how long do you think it takes to actually get your password? If I really want a password, I can brute force into your password, right? especially if I have one of those lists. Actually, there is another really awesome XKCD comic, which I didn't put on my slides, but I'm kind of remembered of it. So who watched Lord of the Rings, especially part one? Do you guys remember when Gandalf stands in front of Moria and he tries to get in? And he's like, ah, you know, it's this elvish word or this dwarven word, and he tries to actually get in there? It's a dictionary attack. So he tries to come up with everything he remembers, and at some point he's just, oh yeah, it's that word. So he does a dictionary attack, he uses common passphrases, and at some point he gets into Moria. So the dwarvens were actually not really smart. So next time they should use something like SHA-1 with salted passwords. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I think we all have this understanding. If you use passwords, please make sure it's actually something secure. Please don't use something like the same password over and over again because that's kind of not secure. If services like Sony get hacked again, your password, sorry, they got hacked like three times in a row, so <laughs> they are a bad example, but they are a good example for me. Um, please make sure not to use the same password and please incentivize your users to actually have secure passwords. There's things like those funny indicators which show you that the temperature is going up or that the quality is better. It makes sense to have these things because your grandma doesn't really care about passwords, but still she should be secure, right? And where do you guys actually put those passwords? So once a user logged in in your service, where do you put them? So who puts passwords in a shared preferences file? Anyone? Come on, there must be at least one. Don't be shy. <laughs> one, <laughs> two. See, actually that's not even bad. The issue is anyone, even without root access on his Android phone, can copy those files on his PC. ADB pool, data, data, slash package name, something. Then there is the package name, dot uh, preferences, XML, or something like that. You pull this thing with ADB pool, you have that file. So if somebody gets your phone because you lose your phone, he could have access to that. I know nowadays Android uh, asks you if you trust this PC and all that stuff. But the sad reality is not everybody has a new Android phone and not everybody has for free or for two or um, all those versions between, like four to one. So let's assume it's okay to have it in there, but please think about encryption. Like MD5 is not really secure. A anyone using MD5 for that stuff because it's very easy to use? One, SHA-1. One, all right. At least you guys encrypt it, which is nice because it's not clear text. Um, still think about using stuff like AES with 250, uh, sorry, 56-bit. That's kind of good. It's actually so much open source around that helps you to encrypt stuff. And one thing that I uh, just recently learned is there is another database standard. Um, so there's SQLite, which you guys know from Android with content providers and all that stuff. 
and there is an encrypted version of it called SQLite Cipher. So they apply uh, 256 AES encryption on any database that you basically create with it. That's awesome. And it actually works on Android. So um, have a look at that. All passwords go in there, and it's secure by design. That's kind of smart. Now, there's this guy, um, Jacob Nielsen. Who knows Nielsen heuri uh, heuristics? Ever heard of it? All right, so he's one of those researcher guys that sits in some university somewhere and thinks about stuff that nobody in real life actually uh, needs. <laughs> but one thing he came up with is actually smart. He called it the, uh, he calls it the Nielsen heuristics. And it's basically a list of user experience patterns that make life uh, for both developers and users easy. So he comes up with very smart things like there should be clear entry and exit points, right? That makes sense. But also, he says something which, for me at least, makes sense. He says, allow users to actually see their inputs. So it's nice that you encrypt passwords with star symbols or points or something like that, and it works. But if I want to see my passport, please provide me an option to actually show it. So this is a website, uh, basically a LinkedIn mobile website. They do that. I see that with lots of other services. Because the issue is the guys using your apps, which just downloaded your apps, might be right now in the Berliner U-Bahn. It's shaky and it's very like mm, tense and you, c you can't really do something. And also they are on the go. And on the other hand, they have a Starbucks coffee. So they try to type something into their phone and it's going to be wrong. So people have these shaky animations or they highlight that the password was wrong and I have to re-enter my stuff. And at some point I uh, will think, screw this. I exit your application, uninstall it, and your big moment to shine is gone, right? You make it hard to access your service by not helping users. So I think this is the easiest approach because it doesn't really require anything except just clicking on a checkbox and something. There is uh, options for edit text to actually do this. So have a think about that. I think that's very easy. And your users will be very happy with that. So for me, um, first step to actually improve experience. But still, you force me to come up with a password. And maybe I don't have a phone password right now around, or I don't come up with a crazy XKCD forward passphrase. So I want to have something different. This is where services like OAuth 1, OAuth 2 come in place. And OAuth 1 is actually still quite young compared to basic OAuth. It got introduced in 2007. And that was all very nice and all very cool. Um, there's people like Aaron Hammer, who used to be like one of those big ITF guys, um, who designed this. Twitter, Yahoo, Google, PayPal, eBay, everybody used it and they loved it. Until at some point in two, uh, 2009, they actually discovered it's not secure. Also, if developers have to implement it client side, they mostly look like this. Who tried to implement OAuth 1 on his own without using any library? Did you like it? Me neither. I tried it. I hated it. There are so many things that you have to think about, like token expiry, token uh, encryption, timestamps. There's like a, I think, 40-page document which tells you how to fucking do it. And the big, uh, big issue is there is no library that you can really use. There's nothing that helps you. Actually, there is a few, but I, I'll go into that. So have a look at OAuth. It's super simple, right? People think it's actually that confusing that they call it an OAuth dance because uh, we, we nerds are actually known to be not able to dance. And basically what it does is your app on the left side, we call it the client side, and the uh, service provider, which is Google, Facebook, us, anyone, on the right side. I request a token, you provide me that temporary token, I use this token to request another token, therefore I have to log in at your service if I logged in correctly. So remember, username, password, but this time not your app's password, but another app's password. I basically type it in correctly, let's, uh, let's assume that. I get another token, I use this token, I direct it to the consumer, and this time I should hopefully have access. That sounds incredibly boring. <laughs> I think that's really bad. But still, right? at least I don't have to come up with another password. I don't have to register again at your service. I don't have to answer things like, 
what's your maiden's, uh, what's your mother's maiden's name, and what's your uh, dog's cousin's name, and also which RPG do you like most. That's all nice, but if I'm on the go, I don't want to enter all that stuff, and sometimes I prefer to actually use or of one logins or or of two logins. So I already told you 2009 or of one A had to come up because people could actually use the redirect back to your application, be it a native, native app or a web app, and they could change the address. So that was incredibly useful. I have a token and I can actually bring it to my service and I can hijack your identity. That was smart, right? <laughs> All right, so uh, they came up with O of 1A, so if you ever wondered where that character comes from, it's just to fix the security breach, and it makes sense. And if you ever have to work with O of 1A, and there is still actually providers working with this, like Evernote, try to think about actually using libraries. One that I love is written by Matthias Kepler, who is now with SoundCloud. He sticked with uh, Quite before, which is now Yelp, I think. And Matthias actually discon uh, discontinued to develop this library himself because he was super confused and super bored by all those different authentication techniques. And also, every service provider implemented this thing differently. So there was no real standard that he could work on and say, if you don't work with the standards, I, I just don't care. So he had to fix his library for Twitter, he had to fix it again for other services. It's open source and gladly enough people file pull requests, so it's, I think, one of the nicest libraries around. Give it a go if you have to work with it. O of 2, whoops, O of 2K. It's more simple, also people realize there's now things like the mobile devices like Android-enabled coffee machines that can tweet, um, lots of different things that actually work and they should have all single sign-on. So in total they came up with seven different scenarios to actually authenticate users. And the actual main framework for this, OAuth 2, got finally published in 2012. Lots of companies are still on a beta draft, like Facebook, they use beta 14, which is not really new, but it works for them, and Facebook Connect is actually one of the nice implementations. And, well, it works, so what you get back is something they call a bearer token, and this token can be used to authenticate API calls afterwards. So we removed some stuff. The temporary token is not there anymore. The redirect URI is actually in the first step already, so you can't just redirect to anything, which makes sense. It got much easier. On Android, if you ever have to work with this, um, it's actually super easy. What you get back is not just the access token, but also something they call refresh token. So one issue with OAuth 1 is they give you this one token, and it doesn't get invalid unless the user logs into Twitter or Facebook or Google and other services and revokes access. It's quite hard to find, and if you don't know this actually exists, users can never ever decline that your, uh, your application. So OAuth 2 is designed to have uh, access tokens which basically are very um, short-living, like something like four to eight hours. And you can afterwards use a refresh token to get another token. The thing is, to get this token, you need your client ID and the password in there, so it actually makes it hard to just hijack this. Just because somebody gets your refresh token, he can't just uh, get tokens on your behalf. So in terms of security, it's kind of good, and it works, it's easy to use. Who worked with OAuth 2 on Android? I think it's much better, do you? He, he nods. You don't even need a library for that. It's so easy it is. What you do is you use a URL connection or the Apache HTTP GET or whatever you use um, to actually do authentications or API calls. And you just set one request property, one header flag uh, called authorization. It's bearer something, and the something would be like a random alphanumeric thing with symbols in it, which is your token. You can also provide it often as a URI parameter, so it's super easy to work with OAuth 2. To be honest, I really like it. If you still don't feel comfy with that, or your implementation for some, sen uh, for some reason doesn't work with it, have a look at Scribe, which is a nice library for that. So Scribe actually enables you to work with most of the standard providers out of the box. And if you find something which uses web views and redirects and all that stuff, and you don't feel comfy doing this, Postmanlib actually 
sits on top of Scribe, and they provide lots of these mechanics. Um, I gave this talk recently in, in London, and both the author of Scribe and Postman said in my talk, which was kind of awesome because we had this really nice discussion about it, and uh, they actually met themselves in London three years ago at the DroidCon and thought, we should help people to make this easy because it should be actually about security and OAuth helps with security, so let's just push this. OAuth 2 and the road to hell. Who heard about this? So Aaron Hammer, I mentioned him earlier. He was one of the guys in the IATF designing this standard. He realized, what have I done? <laughs> he said, basically, it's just barely a blueprint. It's not actually something concrete. I don't really know how to implement it. And he discusses lots of the disadvantages of OAuth 2. So lots of people started to jump in, like Tim Bray, who is now a Google developer advocate, and uh, he used to invent XML with some other guys. So lots of smart people that you might know from IETF and these things discussed and was a big shitstorm about is it actually good or bad and on which side are you? So it was team O off against team something else. Also, security hackers often say OAuth 2 is a big attack surface because since it's just a blueprint, it doesn't really go into how do I encrypt my tokens, where do I store them, do I use cookies or share preferences or databases for that. The document never actually really mentions it. Well, so you have to come up with those things, which is sadly a shame because there should be at least some advice where to put it. Now we know about the user in terms of actually having access, but he's still anonymous to us. And m we might be interested in things like what's his name, what's his email address, his actual physical real address, date of birth, languages, creation dates of accounts, to actually verify that a user exists as a real person. And there's a di few different techniques which help you with that. OpenID, ever, who worked with OpenID or who uses OpenID? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so you see basically less than, uh, less than 10% of people here or maybe 15% of people here use OpenID. It's not really popular and it's actually that not popular that John Rain, one of the biggest providers for OpenID, discontinues myopenid.com, which is the biggest wallet for identities in 2014. They, they basically decided the service is not popular and people don't really understand how to implement it. So there is discovery uh, services around in the web and there's actually not really nice libraries. So we should just screw it. Also in 2012, they discovered there is an authentication bug so I can again hijack your identity. So it's not secure and also it's not really popular. What do we do with it? We just throw it away. So this one browser company, Mozilla, thought, let's take this to the next level. Let's implement it into the browser. Browser ID, persona, these things come up. There is libraries for mobile, but it's not really popular right now and it's not at the stage where it's really stable. So let's have a look at that. Maybe it develops. This year they did some cool stuff with identity bridging. So if you have a Google account, Gmail account, actually you can use it to log in at persona. Let's see how that goes. But still, we don't really know how to combine authentication and authorization, right? I've talked about both. And we are interested in combining these things because sometimes I want access to resources, I want access to identity, and I don't want just a hacky OAuth 2 implementation. So people started to use OpenID with OAuth extensions that was kind of hybrid, but we just learned OpenID had some bugs, also it's not popular and nobody knows how to actually code against it. So let's screw this. OpenID Connect got born. It's uh, still in a beta draft, but it's getting more popular from day to day. And it's another layer on top of OAuth 2. So this time, actually, we use a really clean OAuth 2 implementation just for the whole uh, sorry, authorization part. And for authentication, we have another layer. And it allows for some really cool stuff. So this is OpenID Connect in a nutshell. We have a look at this, and it says session management. So there's actually now a really clean, nice endpoint which defines how to void tokens. So that's kind of good. So you can provide a button in your UI and help people to log out. 
That's nice. Um, also, another thing. You see the whole OAuth stack below it. So instead of just making sure it kind of works and having databases which use databases to get in there, this time you basically um, have access which is really well defined. All right. OpenID Connect, quite nice. I like it a lot. Um, it's getting more popular and I think it's going to be final either this year or next year. Well, still there is a shit ton of different identity providers, more popular ones and less popular ones. I like to um, basically diverse them, diversify them between social and concrete ones. Social means these things plug into your friends, into your consume of what you actually do with apps and these things, concrete, uh, concrete actually pulls real data. So having a look at uh, social, these are the top three. Google Plus sign in, um, it becomes super easy to actually implement it on Android because Google has a really nice library for it. So um, that one is easy, Facebook Connect works through the Facebook SDK or through the redirect through the Facebook app, that's kind of good. Twitter login, not really centralized as a service right now, but still it's quite popular, lots of people have accounts over there. So those things make sense if you have a social app, if you want to have a game, something like SoundCloud, um, those are all nice, but they have one issue. They don't provide you real data. So if you want to have something like the address and the date of birth and is that account actually somehow verified or did the user just create it five minutes ago, you need to plug it into something else. And that's where we come in place. So we've got something we call login with PayPal. Also Amazon has a service which does something similar. And that kind of makes sense. You don't have to implement all three. You don't have to implement all us next to them. It always makes actually sense to think about where do you, my users come from and what data am I interested in? And you should always make it optional. So the flow is quite similar to everything else. You log in, you have a, a browser actually popping up or you use a web view and the user logs in with his password he might still remember and he gets access to your app and you get access to his data. And if you ever work with OAuth uh, services, make sure that they actually say which kind of data they want to access. On OpenID Connect, uh, there, there is these things they call scopes. So I can define I want address, I want email and also the OpenID. And the user gets a list of information being shared. Other, other services sometimes don't do that. So it just says this thing wants to have access to your profile and you don't really see which information is being shared. I'm not too happy with that, but yeah, let's just stick with this. There's best practices for mobile actually on doing this. Either, so Google has this thing they call account manager. That's one way to do uh, OAuth, but lots of services which implement these identities actually don't want you to um, enter these data on a the phone. They want to have a redirect to a web view so they can actually pro provide this service. So they use their own HTTPS certificate and make sure that you don't really log in somewhere and you share your details, right? The issue obviously is I can fake a web view which looks like a service and still can access these data. So also one thing that works is I can fire an intent against Chrome and register my application for a callback URL. Again, the issue you can make an activity which looks like Chrome and you can fake the HTTPS thing. So there's not actually a really, really great way to do it, but they are working on it. So there's things that they're working on like adding another passphrase, adding things like public keys to make sure it's actually the real service. But right now there is more, let's just make sure you don't download uh, dodgy applications, download good ones. If the app doesn't have any users and it also has lots of advertisements and it looks really weird, think about actually not sharing your identity with them. And now you might think, wow, well, that all is still nice and it maybe makes sense and maybe I don't want to come up with another passport, but why? <laughs> People forgot passwords. That's the easiest one. So there was this survey from a consultancy saying 45% of all users, they actually surveyed said that they forgot passwords and if they do, they are not really interested in 
entering the security question because sometimes they enter something stupid like uh, Google Google on Google or with us we have lots of people actually saying PayPal PayPal as security question and answer. So um, think about if you actually enter data in there, make sure you can remember it. But still, there's this thing in the internet called conversion, um, which means if somebody comes to your service and he's getting annoyed and he drops off, you have a conversion rate of 0%. If he actually consumes what you do, you have a conversion rate of 100% with that guy. And summarized, you want to be more close to the 100 than to the 0, right? So make it easy and accessible for that guy. And also people hate clicking on I forgot my passport, entering tons of things and waiting for an email to pop up. Because on mobile, people want to consume stuff right now and not in five minutes. Because in five minutes, my, they might need to actually change the tube that they are in. Also, they hate to register. As I already said, if I have to come up with another username, I have to enter my email and all that thing, I'm getting annoyed. There is nowadays things like Chrome with Autofill and Safari that helps, but still, you need to come up with passwords. We just learned coming up with a password shouldn't be easy, but still I need to remember them and also maybe I don't have data so I can't store it into my secure password cloud. So lots of things that we actually have to face. So it makes sense to use the social guys and actually stick with them. 66% of those surveyed people, I know it's a fairly small number of people, but still I think it's quite representative. They think it's desirable to actually go for social sign-ins at least as an alternative to registering on your own. And one piece of advice that I want to give you is don't use identity actually as a barrier to, like to enter to your service. Who downloads apps and the, the basically sees the first thing that they basically do if they open the app is please log in with and then there's a list of things and you have to click on that because otherwise you can't see what the app actually does. Like, who saw that on Android, on iOS, on somewhere? Do you think it sucks? Yeah, it sucks, right? <laughs> Actually, there's a startup from Berlin, um, they are called Vamos, who recently thought about why do we actually still do that? And they tried with A-B tests if users like that or not. And they discovered if they don't force users to log in, but they incentivize it by actually enabling more features they get much more users to actually really log in. So people like to preview your stuff before they log in because they want to know what you do with that data, if it actually really makes sense and if they would use the application again. Because we just learned it's very hard to revoke access. I need to know where to do that and I don't want to go again to Twitter and do that. So I recently, um, who knows Buffer? It's a social media app that allows you to put lots of tweets and Facebook stuff into like a queue and it posts these things automatically for you. I do that because I fly a lot and they got hacked, I think, this weekend. So lots of access tokens were leaked because of obviously they were not encrypted and everybody had access to Facebook, LinkedIn and Facebook, which was not really great. And well, so Buffer actually had this issue. They had to uh, revoke services, but sometimes they couldn't do that for the user. So I had to go to Twitter again and I saw there's actually a big list of things that I authorized once. SlideShare, SoundCloud, lots of services, but maybe I don't use them anymore, but they have still API access, right? Like, does that really make sense? So don't force user into using an identity. Sometimes it should be just easy to provide previews, show them what your app does, and afterwards they log in if they like it. Wrapping up things, Identity does matter a lot, and also different identities matter. People like to choose one for Facebook, um, sorry, one like Facebook for social things. People also like to use Google Plus and Android because it's very native and very nice to actually log in. On other OS, it's still kind of painful because they might have two-factor authentication. They need to wait for the password to come in. and. One thing that matters to me a lot is user uh, experience should not be Im impaired. It should be enhanced. I should enjoy using social sign-in because it makes your app more awesome. It shouldn't be a necessity that I have to do to actually consume your app. Thank you. Any questions? No? Yes? No?
One. Thank you. Um, this uh, discussion about uh, OAuth 2 and the road to hell, mm -hmm. if I understood correctly, you were saying it's cryptographically not secure. Is that correct? Because of the missing signature of the Bureau token. So it's not not secure. It's just not going into how to actually secure it. So it leaves it up to the guy who implements the service to actually f uh, come up with things like encrypt the tokens, make sure they are in a nice SHA-1 sorted uh, database somewhere, make sure it's going to be assessed with HTTPS. So that means OAuth 1 was complicated, but it had all this yeah. stuff, and OAuth 2 is easy, but missing all that stuff, and that's why insecure. Yeah, absolutely. Correct? So OAuth 1 used to be actually more secure because more things were more detailed in the implementation, and more things were actually forced. So on um, of two implementations, in, it often says your endpoint should be something with HTTPS. But if you do HTTP, it still works. So no certificate is actually required to use those services. So um, I don't say that of two services are not secure, because there are nowadays best practices on actually how to do it. But the blueprint as a thing, it doesn't really tell you how to use it nicely. So uh, that's why actually for a long time people just stick with the O of one flow because there was not enough advice on actually how to make sure it's actually really smooth and secure. Is there a link between TLS client auth and OAuth 2? Not that I'm aware of, not at, at least something very specific. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I just came up with the question, so uh, I'm in the, in, in the internet like from like 2000 or so, running around everywhere and know a lot of stuff. Um, there are a lot of places where you need to log in. And mm -hmm. It starts a lot of boards, forums, where you need to have a login to see a picture attached, stuff like this. So uh, when I think back, I just thought about how many uh, times did I uh, register somewhere? I don't know, over 100 at least. So uh, I have to reuse passwords. Um, you can't remember them or use the funny um, send me my password mm -hmm. thing if you remember the email and still have that email address. Um, but now there are a lot of different things in the web or now with apps. So there are some stuff that's that are more secure, some stuff that are less secure, like the board where you only need the account to see the picture or stuff like this. And then there are web pages where maybe I don't want that anybody knows I'm there. Maybe some of privacy reasons, maybe some for um, medical reasons or mm -hmm. stuff like this. Um, so when I use some authentication provider, um, then there's also the question, uh, he knows where I am in the internet. And that's not always um, something uh, I, I'm really s um, secure about. So um, what are the difference between those uh, authentications or um, stuff there between the, you're in terms of privacy or security? Can you say something? <coughs> of course. Um, so first, yes. <laughs> I agree there's shit tons of things that I used back then with GMX addresses and all that stuff that I never ever access any uh, anymore. But still, I used all those dodgy forums back then. And I agree, I might reuse passwords without even knowing about that. And um, there is actually all those social signing things nowadays. But I think they should be optional. I shouldn't be forced into actually doing that. So if I think I share really sensitive data, like you say, medical things. If I have diabetes and I go into some medical forum, does Facebook have to know? Do we have to know? No, I don't think so, right? It should be optional. If I want to use it because I am on the go and I don't want to enter all that data on my own, all right, let's do that. So I think, as I said basically on there, my wrap up, um, the user experience should always be just optional with single sign on and that things, but I shouldn't really force people into doing that because otherwise I end up with this big barrier and um, I think the issue is not passwords as a thing. The issue is more people tend to reuse the same thing and not everybody is as aware as developers. So it's not just you guys who think about secure passwords and maybe not reusing the same thing for the top 10 different services you use. We always have to think about our grandma, or my uncle, my um, 
cousins who might be in a totally different thing and they run into these issues. So if one bad form sadly got, uh, gets hacked, which happens every now and then, and user data gets get, uh, basically acquired and people try to go to the top 50 services, log in there and they have the same email address and the same password, they are screwed, right? So that's one of the issues that I see. And the nice thing, which why I like Auth2 as an example is, an access token only works for one service. So even if I have an account somewhere and it gets hacked, they have access to this one service and afterwards I just revoke it and they can't access that service anymore but the others are still secure. So it's more about actually limiting danger to certain spots instead of opening up my whole security to everything. Does that answer it? Or? Yeah, yeah uh, thank you and just a new question. Um, are there now um, those uh, identity services uh, new vectors of attack? I think so. Why uh, attack some website uh, if you can attack uh, all of them at once for a user? Yes. <laughs> Again, um, if, if you use those kind of uh, services and if you manage to get into Facebook, us, Google, and you have all these applications attached to that for some reason, you basically open up a big thing, right? Like if I get access to your Google account, you're screwed anyway. You have all your data in there, you have your emails in there, maybe your calendar, you use Google Docs for some reasons. Yes, um, so the thing is if I use one big service and I basically aggregate lots of different tiny services around that, it's getting more dangerous. So it's the responsibility of the identity providers like Google us to harden our security over and over again. And that's why they do things like bug bounty programs where they actually pay hackers to think, uh, think about attack for their services, think about weak spots, trying to get in there and if they find something they should report it. And that's a really positive form of hacking, right? You get paid for uh, having fun and I think that makes sense. So. Um, Absolutely, if I go to these services, I'm going to have a big problem. The nice thing is, which I like is basically, the identity provider doesn't have to store the access token. So the app, the consumer, stores it of course somewhere and gets access to a certain set of data from the big provider, but the big provider doesn't necessarily have access to the data of the other service, right? So it's more like an implication, not an equivalent relation. Anything else? Questions? I'm here all day anyway, so <laughs> you can't escape me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>